I was looking back over the titles of the lessons that we've had in Colossians, and as we began our study, the first one was the gospel's power, and all this is in your uh, quarterly there that you can look at. And uh, the second gospel uh, lesson that we had was the gospel's goal, and then the gospel's forgiveness, the gospel's freedom, the gospel lived, and tonight we're going to look, be looking at the gospel and relationships. And as I began studying this uh, lesson, I thought about how many times have I uh, sat in a church service and listened either to a pastor preaching or how many times have I sat in Sunday school and listened to a Sunday school lesson be taught. And, you know, for many of us, it's uh, numerous times. We don't remember the time we were there and we don't remember the time we weren't there, right? I don't know how many times I, I thought about sitting down and saying, well, I, I'm this age, whatever that age is, and 52 weeks and so forth and so on. But I, I would imagine a lot of us have been in revival services and, and other services in addition to just preaching and teaching. But I think as we come to the lesson tonight, Paul is saying, okay, you've listened, you've heard, you've been taught, now what are you going to do with it? And that's why I think he's bringing us to this point of talking about the gospel and the various relationships we, that we have, and we'll see this as we go through the study. It's the family, and also we're going to talk a little bit about employer-employee relationships and that, that uh, thing that happens to make it work uh, in, a, in a good and spiritual manner. So as we begin our study tonight, I'd like to share with you one thing that I found, and this came from Warren Wearsby, and he's talking about the home. And he says, something is radically wrong with homes today. And I think we all would agree that there are some things that are not going well. The last report I saw indicated that in America, there are now more broken homes than ever. Single parent families are on the increase. Over half of all the mothers are now working outside the home, and many of them have small children. The average American child from 6 to 16 watches, and I thought this was astounding, from 20 to 24 hours of television each week and is greatly influenced by what he sees. So I think we can see that TV has taken the place of some of the parenting uh, that you and I had when we were growing up. The battered child syndrome continues to increase with from two to four million cases being reported annually, and many are not reported at all. Centuries ago, Confucius said the strength of a nation is derived from the integrity of the homes. One of the greatest things we can do as individuals is to help build godly Christian homes. Paul addressed the various members of the family and pointed out the factors that make for a strong and godly home. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight as we conclude our study in Colossians. It begins in chapter 3, and you'll recall the last time we had Sunday school week before last, Charles covered two lessons and got us up to the point of where we will begin this evening. And um, we're going to begin... Uh, chapter 3, verse 18 is where our lesson text actually takes place. But I want to back up one verse to three, chapter 3, verse number 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And I think that's an important foundation for what we're going to be looking at tonight because it says in everything that we do, we're to be God-honoring. We're to be striving to please Him in every action we take, in every word that we speak. And as He brings that into the family setting, I hope that we can at least be prayerful about the things that are happening around us. Now, I, I'm going to make a big assumption that all of us are Christians tonight, and we're raising Christian homes, Christian families, and that we are God-honoring in everything that we do, right? We never have any crosswords or anything like that. No, we'll get into that later. But 
Paul begins talking about first the wives. And you say, why in the world would he do that? Well, think about the position of a, or the status of a woman during the time that we were, stu- that we're studying. Uh, women were considered to be really a piece of property, weren't they? And they didn't really have a lot of social standing, but God, but Christ. He came and changed that whole picture. And so as Paul begins talking about the family tonight, he first says to the wives, submit yourself to your husband. And for those that like to take the Bible out of context, it'd be neat to say, submit yourself to your husband, right? But go back to verse 17. Everything that we do, we're to do to honor God, to be pleasing to Him. All of our actions, words, activities, whether it's at home, whether it's outside. And I'm going to say again, I've said this before, that it's awfully easy in here to treat each other kindly, isn't it? The pastor this morning said, go find somebody that you appreciate, tell them that you love them, tell them you appreciate them for who they are and what they are. And it's easy for us to do here, but what about tomorrow? We're going to see some people we may not have seen for a while. We're going to run into some situations that we maybe haven't encountered before. So Paul says, to begin with, wives, submit yourselves to your husband. Now think about the order of creation. Go back to Genesis, who was created first? Adam, exactly, thank you. Adam was the first in creation, and then what happened? Eve was created, the woman. And then what did God say? He says, multiply, increase, have children. So wives, their place, their their position, if you will, is to be submissive to the husband. Not that it has any derogatory connotation, but it is that order of creation, and we know that God does everything perfectly and in order, don't we? That he maintains that order in everything that he's done. Look at the whole creation process, if you will. So the order of creation, submit yourselves to your husband, Again, as it is fit unto the Lord. I want us to turn over, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 5. And I want to look at a few verses there. And they're going to be very similar. But I think they're very important for us to look at. As Paul again expresses pretty much the same uh, sentiment that he has here. Beginning in verse number 22 of chapter 5 in Ephesians. Wives submit, your, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now think about that. In submission, just as Christ is to the church. And I think that's so important. How did Christ love the church? He loved it conditionally. Unconditionally, he loved it sacrificially in order that it would be his church and his representative people. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. That sort of changes it, doesn't it? That gives it a different emphasis, if you will, on how we're to do it. How wives are to to submit to their husbands, just as Christ and the church. Think about that relationship. It's very special, isn't it? You think about the word agape. Christ loved the church. He loves the church today. But how is the church to act? To be submissive to him. So wives, be submissive to your husband. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body. 
of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to the wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, I think it's important to note that contained in those verses, there are three or four of them that relate to the wife, and the rest of them relate to the husband. So it is a God-given blessing for the husband and the wife to be together, to have that Christian home, and to multiply and have children within that Christian home. So he says, wives, submit yourself to your husband. The husband is to provide loving leadership. That's quite a responsibility, isn't it? But yet, where has God placed the husband? Placed him in charge of that household, hasn't he? So together they will work, one being submissive to the other. He's not to be some strong-armed character. He's not to be an overlord. He's not to be demanding all the time. You've seen and heard of instances where that's happened. That's why uh, Wearsby, I think, wrote what he did about the problems in the home today. Some, place, some homes are not God-centered or not Christ-centered and have lost, really, their way in being an effective Christian home. So then notice in verse 19, he says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. It means don't be harsh with them. Love them. Respect them. And again, come back to that relationship that Christ has with the church, that agape love, sacrificially, that he would give his life, as we're going to talk about a little bit later on, for people. That's pretty strong love, isn't it? Agape love. Willing to give in order that a person like me, like you, would have the opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He's saying, don't be cross with your wife. Does that mean you're never going to have an argument? Anybody in here argue with her spouse? Becky's sitting there. I've got. We've we've had some, but thank God we've made it 53 years, and He's allowed us to get through those difficult times, and that's what He does for each of us. He allows us to work through those times. You know, it's sort of like the Christian life. The Christian life is not passive. Nor have I ever read anywhere that's always going to be easy. Have you? I don't think it's in the book that way. But it calls us to action, and it also tells us not to let the sun go down on our anger or wrath, but to be loving to Christ, to be loving to each other. Wouldn't it be great if we could all come in here and look around and say, man, everything's great with all of us? Do we ever have any disagreements among ourselves in church? We do, don't we? But what's our goal? To work through those in love and to reach a mutual understanding just like it is in a marriage. You work through those things, you stay Christ-focused, and you reach a resolution. So, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as in Christ. And Paul used that term a number of times. In Christ, in him, with him, with Christ being the leader, the one who sets the standard for us. And then he says, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Now to say obey is something that is not just a, a one-time occurrence. It's an ongoing. And I feel like thinking to the choir in here because we don't really have children in here. But we were all children at one time, weren't we? We were obedient to our parents. Yeah, we caused trouble. Becky and I were talking the other day about sometimes when we had whippings. 
And you all know what a whipping is. Daddy had peach trees and he cut them all down after we got out of high school. And it didn't occur to me why until years later because we had to go out and choose the limb that we wanted him to use for our whipping. He'd take that limb and rip those leaves off of there. But we needed it. We deserved it. And he was doing that in love to help us to see where we needed to be, how to get back on the straight and narrow, and do those things that we should do. So obey your parents in all things, and in all things would be the measure of a child's obedience, but isn't it also a measure of our obedience to God to obey Him in all things? Does that say we're never going to make a mistake? No. We're going to make mistakes. But that we're striving to be obedient to Him in everything that we do as we go through life. For this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. What's the motive? Why, why do we do things? We want to please the Lord, don't we? You want to please your spouse, don't you? Do your head this way. That's the right answer. We all want to please the Lord. We want to please each other. We want to be around people who are pleasant. So it says this is the, the motive, is that we want to be well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children. And there that word fathers uh, can mean husband and wife because if you go back and you read about Moses, it said his parents placed him in the river in order that he might be saved from, from death. So fathers, provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. And that provoke not is a command to the parents because when you provoke someone, what happens? Well, it can become a fight. It can be a, a long, uh, dry spell in our speech. It can be hard feelings that develop between people. But it says don't provoke them to anger, but rather encourage, rather build up, rather help them to be the person they need to be. I found this about John Starkey. John Starkey was a violent British criminal. He murdered his wife and then was convicted for the crime and he was executed. The officials asked William Booth, uh, who was founder of the Salvation Army, to conduct Starkey's funeral. Booth faced as ugly and as mean a crowd, he said, as he had ever seen. But his first word stopped them. He said, John Starkey never had a praying mother. Now think about that. So what do you do for your children? We need to pray for them, don't we? What do we need to do for our grandchildren? We need to pray for them, don't we? That they would have a right relationship with God that they would have the opportunity to grow up in a Christian home. And a lot is said about the rights of children. They have a right to be born, and I'm so thankful that our church, Mark, pastor, is trying to do something to make Randolph County a sanctuary city, and I hope that's going to multiply all the way across the state. Another is right to be born into a Christian home where they'll be raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They have a right to have godly parents who will love them and teach them God's Word. You think about those rights and responsibilities to us as parents and grandparents. It's a heavy burden, isn't it? It's a heavy responsibility. We had a friend in Spartanburg who was the superintendent of District 2 schools. His name was Buddy Jennings. And he said they, of course, had numerous discipline problems with some of the students. And he said the parents would come to him and say, why can't you all do more to improve my child's behavior? 
And he said, I would just look across the desk at them and say, we have them six and a half hours a day. You have them 17 and a half hours per day. So what are you doing in order to improve their behavior? Pretty tough, isn't it? But it's pretty telling because we have an opportunity and a responsibility at home for those children. Children have the rights, but they also have the responsibility, and the main one being to obey. The child who does not obey his parents will not likely respect or obey authority as they go on in life. And I think we're seeing a lot of that today. That if they don't get it at home, they're not going to take it with them because they have nothing to take with them. They're not going to have the respect that they need, nor give the respect to those in authority. And then in verse 22, Paul begins talking about servants. And I want to share this with you. Slavery was an established institution in Paul's day, and it said there were perhaps as many as 60 million slaves. They were all different degrees, uneducated, those that did manual work, but there were also educated slaves that uh, worked in some of the homes to train and to teach the children. What, what about opposition by the church to slavery? The church at that time was a minority group with no political power to change that institution. The purpose of the early church was to witness, uh, to win souls, and to spread the gospel. Some of the writers talked about the fact that nothing was said in here against slavery. And I think we have to understand where slavery was then and what happened in later years. And if they had not been careful, then the message of the church could have gotten in, interpreted in the wrong way. So that's why Paul didn't come out and say, don't do it, but rather work through it. So in verse 22, he says, Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. I used to work for a man who would say, you can ask anyone to do anything as long as it's not illegal, unlawful, or immoral. And that's certainly true, isn't it? So if we have employees or if we've been an employee we have an obligation to do what we're asked to do don't we but we also have the responsibility to keep God first and as long as it doesn't violate God's law then we ought to do it we ought to be faithful and many of you have been business owners and as well as employees and you know the responsibility of each party and we're going to talk a little bit more about those as we go on in a minute. When we think about doing things according to the flesh and not according to eye service, we're, we don't want to be just a men pleaser. And the term that popped into my mind talking about that was character. What is character? I know nobody's going to say anything, so I'm going to help you. Character is what, what we are and what we do when nobody else is watching. Right? There's nobody watching me, so I'm going to cut a corner. I'm going to do this or that. But character is that which holds us true to the principles of God. Then going on in verse 23... And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Notice it doesn't say do it lazily. It doesn't say to do it sloppily. It says do it heartily, as if you're doing it unto the Lord. Now, I enjoy doing some woodworking. I used to do a good bit of it. I don't do as much anymore. But it would be late at night, and you'd be working on something. You wanted to get it finished, and you think, well, I can just... I can leave this out. I can do this and save me a little time. But for some reason, it always came, to back, came back to me, do it as is pleasing to the Lord. I don't know why. Is that your conscience that does that? 
Don't cut corners. Do everything as if you're doing it for the Lord. And it's, it's going to tell us in the next verse why we need to do that. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. What is the reward that we're all looking for? Heaven, isn't it? Do you want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, or not well done? You've been unfaithful. I want to hear well done, don't you? In everything that we do, we need to be God-honoring, God-pleasing, and striving to serve Him to the best of our ability. That's our reward. It's not going to be cutting corners. It's not going to be doing those things that we just want to do, but what can we do to honor and to please God? But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. It doesn't matter what the social status is when that judgment day comes, is it? We're all going to be looked at the same. It doesn't matter what kind of job you have had, how much money you have, whatever your social status might be. God does not respect persons. The heart of every problem is the problem of the heart. And only God's Word and God's Spirit can change and control the condition of that heart. I thought that was pretty telling. The heart of every problem is the problem of the heart. Think about that. And then moving on into chapter 4, Master is given to your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. In other words, he's saying, give them equal pay for what they do. And sometimes when we look at pay scales and we look at what somebody else is doing in relation to what we're doing, what do we often say? Well, he don't need to be making that much. He doesn't need to be making that much. I'm doing a lot more, right? That's kind of the way it goes. But if we're doing it in a way that will honor God and we're able to live on what we're getting paid, we all want more, don't we? Charles Stanley asked the most important question, I think, how much is enough? Think about that. You say, well, if I could just make X number of dollars a year, and then you get to that point, what happens? Well, if I could just, if I could just, and we want more and more. But he's saying here that masters need to be fair to the workers. Employers need to be fair to the workers. He's talking about slaves here, your servants. And notice what he says, just and equal. Why? Where's our master? He's in heaven, isn't he? And he's the one that's going to give the final reward and awards. We all like to have good pay, don't we? We all like attaboys. You know what an attaboy is. We all like to have that. A person's social status should never determine a believer's, believer's behavior towards them. The Christian's treatment of others should flow out of a heart of love for God. And I come back to what I say so many times. If someone else comes in those doors that doesn't look exactly like us, how are we going to treat them? And then going on into verse 2, we're going to look at the importance of speech and some things that Paul had to say. He says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Continue in prayer. How often do you pray? I dare say that if something is happening in our lives that's really going to affect us, maybe in a bad way, what do we do? Don't we pray harder? That's the time when we pray the most, isn't it? But he says, always be in an attitude of prayer. Be faithful and be devoted in your prayer life and watch. You remember Jesus asked Simon to do what? Stay here while I go up on the mountain and pray. And what did Simon do? How many of us ever fall asleep? We don't stay alert. We don't pay good attention. But he says also with thanksgiving. If we only ask and never give thanks to God, 
that makes us selfish people, doesn't it? We ought to be thankful all the time. We're getting ready Thursday to, to celebrate Thanksgiving. Is that the only day we need to be thankful to God for what he's done for each of us? No, it's not. But we place a special emphasis on this week and that day. And we say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us, giving us a big table of food that we'll all probably eat too much of. But we need to thank him continually for what he does for us each and every day. And then he says, with all, praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Paul was not ashamed to ask for prayer. He wanted people to pray for him because he had a tremendous task. Now think about where Paul was. He's in a, in a, under arrest in a house. He could still have visitors, but he said, pray for me. Why was that important? He wanted to continue sharing the gospel. He asked for doors to be open. He's not talking about the doors to his house where he could get out, but he's asking for doors and opportunities to be made available to him to share the gospel of Christ. That was his goal. He didn't care where he was. He'd already been beaten, shipwrecked, and all those other things that he mentions. But he says, I want to continue sharing the gospel. What is our desire today? Is it to do the same? Is it to get the word of God out? To speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. We need to pray, don't we? We need to stay alert. We need to pray for our pastors. I thought about it as I studied this lesson. These guys have people that come to them all the time with what? Problems, conditions, troubles. We need to pray for them. Who do they have to talk to? They can talk to each other. But you think about, just say, 250 people coming at you all the time with something. We need to pray for them. We need to keep them lifted up in prayer. And then he says in verse 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Walk as we go, our daily lives, the things that we encounter. We need to do in wisdom. We spent a lot of time last quarter and the quarter before that talking about the word wisdom. And Paul is saying here that we need to, as we go about day to day, walk in the wisdom that God can give us. We need to share Christ. Toward them that are outside the family, who are they? Those that are lost. Redeeming the time, taking an opportunity to share the gospel with those with whom we come in contact. Have you ever been talking to someone and later you say, why in the world didn't I take the door when, when, didn't I take the opportunity when that door was open to me to share the gospel with them? We've all had those times, haven't we? So as I've gotten older, I've tried to think, well, I need to be more alert. I need to take that opportunity just to share a word, if nothing else. You see, sometimes we, when we plant a word, we're planting a seed, aren't we? We're letting people know about Jesus Christ. So he says, redeem the time. Be alert to opportunities to witness. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you know, may know how you ought to answer every man. Seasoned with salt. You know, a lot of times it's how we say something that drives home a point, isn't it? I went to a seminar one time and they were all men that were there, nothing against the ladies, they just happened to be all men, they were managers. And this guy came in and he was talking about the importance of how we say things. And he said, for example, you wouldn't look at a woman and say you've got a face that would stop a clock. But he said, rather you might say, when I look at you, time stands still. <laughs> he got the same point across, but he said it in a manner that was more pleasing than you're ugly, you know. 
So it's how we say things. And everybody has to be spoken to a little differently. You've seen that, haven't you? That you can't use the same word for everybody because some people misinterpret it. But we need to do it in love and we need to do it in grace as is talked about here. So in closing this lesson, what is our attitude toward others that may or may not look like us? Will we be accepting of them? How is our prayer life individually and for others? Paul says always pray, be alert, watch. Am I always speaking with grace toward others? And I want to go back, if you will, to chapter 4, and I want to look at verse 17. He says, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. And this is Archippus taking the letter back uh, that Paul has written. But take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. It's an obligation, it's a responsibility, but it's not insurmountable with the help of God. Would you agree? Good. We're going over to Flamin now, and we're just about going to run out of time, I'm afraid, but we'll do what we do. In the book of Philemon, which is only 25 verses, uh, Paul, uh, Philemon must have been a person of means because if you look there in verse number one, it's, oh, by the way, just turn over a few pages. It's right there. Uh, he says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. Notice what he says, our beloved friend. He's one that's working with us. He's one that's helping us. He's one that's going along with us. And then to the church and so forth. But notice what he does in verse number four. He begins, I think we could say, patting him on the back. He says, I thank my God, I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you. And notice what he says then, brother. So he's, I think, lifting up Philemon. He's letting him know that he's aware of who he is. He's letting him know that he's aware of what he has done and what he's continuing to do. And you know, I think that's so important in sharing the gospel, we have to build a relationship with other people in order to be able to do that. And how do we do that? We encourage them, we lift them up, we pray for them, and we pray that God would give us the opportunity and the words that we need to say in order to share a word of witness to him, to them. So then going over to verse number eight, Paul says, wherefore, or looking at all those other things, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, that which is convenient, or that which is right. Philemon was a refreshing believer to Paul. He was one that had encouraged Paul, no doubt, and he's one that Paul and he had a relationship with, even though it was maybe a long-distance relationship, because Philemon was in Colossae and Paul was in Rome in in a prison. But he says, because of all these things, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, that which is right or that which is convenient. So they had this relationship built on Jesus Christ. And you know, we can have friends and no matter where we are, as long as we have that relationship or that foundation in Christ, we can have a mutual understanding of what God would have us to do and we can also be an encouragement and a help to each other as we pray for each other. Yet for love's sake, I'd rather beseech 
D, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm begging you, if you will. And he could have done that being an apostle, and he said, I'm going to use my authority as an apostle to command you to accept this one back. He's through, and we're going to talk more about Onesimus in a minute. But I could command you as an apostle of Jesus Christ that you just take him back. You don't do anything to him. But that's not what Paul does. All the aged and also a prisoner. How could you turn down a request like that? It would be hard, wouldn't it? Because of the condition where Paul found himself. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. And Philemon, that word means one who is kind. And Onesimus uh, is one who is profitable. And that word is going to pop up again in just a few moments. But Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Onesimus is a new person now. And you look at the history of it and and he had run away, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But he was now a changed man. He had met Christ. And when we see a Christ-centered person, even though he was a slave, he now becomes a kinsman with Paul, with Philemon. And Paul is trying to encourage Philemon to take him back as one of ours, and we're going to see how that develops as we go along. So Onesimus is now a kinsman. He's now one that is of great value to Paul. And he says, which in time past was to the unprofitable. Remember the name means profitable. He was unprofitable to you because perhaps he stole from you, he ran away, he left you, and nobody knows the value of Onesimus. They don't know what Philemon had paid for him. But he had become unprofitable because he took off. You know, I just wonder about our status as a Christian when we sort of don't do what we need to do, when we turn our back maybe if we have an opportunity to fulfill a job. We have an opportunity to serve someone. Do we become unprofitable to God? And we have to repent and ask for forgiveness and restoration, and that's what we're looking at in the life of Onesimus. Paul is begging Philemon to take him back and to restore him as one of his. But there's a lot more to it than that, as we're going to see. So he's calling on Philemon to do not only that, but to go above and beyond. Who does that sound like? Christ. Go that extra mile. Somebody wrongs you. Don't go one, go two. Don't go two, go four. And on and on. So what happened to Onesimus? I don't know. But I'm going to share share with you what uh, David Jeremiah said. Uh, Secular history suggests as well, 50 years after the letter to Philemon was written, Ignatius drafted a letter to the church in Ephesus in which he mentioned a bishop named Onesimus who was profitable in Christ. The same word Paul used in verse 11. Apparently, by the grace of God, Onesimus, the runaway slave, became the bishop of Ephesus. Don't know if that actually happened, but that's the best information I could find. I gotta stop. Love all of you. Appreciate your being here.